Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, thank you for staying uh, through the end to, to, to listen to me, hopefully. Um, I've had a great time here. I hope all of you have had a great time as well. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that, uh, I, one of the pieces of advice I've been given is that when you have good news and bad news, you should give the bad news first, right? So I'm gonna start with some bad news, which is that this is the last talk of AnacondaCon. So after this, all we, have, all we can really do is go down to the hotel bar and drink. Um, but, uh, but there's another piece of bad news as well, unfortunately, which is if any of you have seen Gartner's Magic Quadrant for data science, AI, machine learning uh, in 2019, and they put us in the lower left-hand quadrant, which is where we've always been, so it feels like home. But on the other hand, it's not so great. Um, and actually, George Piatetsky at Katie Nuggets uh, made a little diagram to show how everyone else fared. And you'll notice there's more uh, red than green on there, so most of the uh, folks that were being evaluated did uh, regress in that. Uh, a few people uh, really slid forward. Um, MathWorks, for instance, MATLAB has become a visionary in data science. Um, others have done not so well. But in general, um, you know, we're in good company in terms of people who move backwards on the magic quadrant, so maybe I shouldn't feel so bad. But, um, but actually, when you go and you look at other folks, so, so Gardner is not the only one that evaluates these kinds of things. Um, and so the Slash Data folks, they surveyed you know, over 8,000 machine learning practitioners, and they compared a net promoter score versus awareness and mind share. And in their survey that just, that just came out uh, a little while ago, actually, they put Anaconda in the upper right as having most mind share and most developer satisfaction. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, and then, and they're not, and they actually have, you know, a, a little, uh, little blurb in there, which is great. They said that Anaconda is the undisputed leader across mindshare and satisfaction. In fact, it's the polar opposite to SaaS Enterprise Miner. Um, and, uh, and so this is nice to see. And then others, so this is um, machine learning practitioner sentiment. There's other folks, the uh, Enterprise Tech Research Group, they have a, uh, a group they call VEN, which goes and surveys 700, um, actually 4,000, CIOs, and out of those, about 700 are currently evaluating machine learning and AI platforms, data science platforms, and when they ask them, and these are budget holders, these are people who have budget who are currently evaluating uh, or even currently procuring different kinds of solutions, and so they ask them, what are, you, what are you looking at, what are you evaluating, what are you gonna allocate further, and among them, Anaconda ranked the highest of mind share, so we're at the very top with 47%, Databricks comes right behind us at 44%, and then it kinda goes down from there. Um, and when they looked at actual sentiment uh, in addition to the mind share, they put us in the upper right-hand corner as well. So green star, yay, that's the right place to be. And so when you look at this, you're like, okay, there's a lot of data in the, in the field that puts us in one corner, and then Gartner puts in the other, and, and why is that? Why does Gartner hate us, right? And so Gartner explains, Gartner explains in the, if you actually go and read the, the, the magic quadrant, as opposed to just look at the picture of the quadrant, um, they explain by saying, look, a vendor in the leading quadrant may not be the best choice for you. And in fact, a niche player might be the perfect choice. That sounds great, right? So the next time that we go into a discussion and there is some C-level person who says, hey, I see you're in the magic quadrant, we'll say, yes, we're in the magic quadrant in the lower left. You're supposed to apply a rotation matrix. And that then <laughs> puts us into the upper right, which means we're the perfect solution for you, right? Um, so I think this is essentially what Gardner wants us to do. Now, of course, we all know that this is not actually going to work, right? So I think that if Gardner is actually serious about their admonition uh, next year, they should call in the 2020 Magic Quadrant, they should call it the unordered list. And then I don't really care where they put me in an unordered list. Um, but, uh, but more seriously, actually, for all the, all the crap about Gardner, actually, they do understand a lot about data science. And in fact, this is a slide from George Pietetsky, who, uh, not George Pietetsky, from Pete Krensky. Uh, at the, at the uh, Orlando Summit that Gartner does. And, um, and he's explaining that their Magic Quadrant this year absolutely had an apples to oranges comparison. They did put us all in the same fruit basket, but, um, but they are different kinds of things. And so, um, and so I've actually, if you look at what Gartner is saying, how they're thinking about this whole field of machine learning and data science, they actually have a lot of understanding about this. They, they, um, they have a lot of things. I mean, this definition of data science and machine learning, I can't take any issue with it at all. It's absolutely... Uh, very good. And the little diagram they have, I think, captures very well kind of the different kinds of activities that businesses are used to doing, you know, between data to decision to action. All this lines up great. And in fact, they actually have a really nice breakdown of the 
uh, different steps of a, a workflow that a data scientist uh, will go through in, their, in the process of doing you know, data ingests and, and model exploration and, and things like that, feature engineering. I thought it captured it beautifully. Like I think you know, there's a lot of data scientists here in the room. You can look at that and say, yeah, I, roughly that's kind of the things I do. Um, they have a really nice skill map as well that says you know, data engineers and developers and IT folks and analysts, they all have different kind of skills across this thing. Um, and they have this really nice, actually, the, the diagram I, I like quite a bit, this one that shows kind of the different steps along the way as you go and do initial data science to then operationalizing, um, actually trying to operationalize a model. And um, so I, I liked all of this, and it's like, well, they clearly get it, and yet they still put us in the same basket of fruit with other fruit that are not us. And so, um, but even as I looked at this diagram, I sort of started getting this kind of, uh, something was like not sitting right with me. And I thought about it a little bit more and that made me realize there's something that they're missing. There's sort of a category error they're making about data science. So that's my first thing I'm gonna talk about, um, which is data science. So uh, a few weeks before the, the Gartner conference, there was a blog post from Eric Olson who's at Stitch Fix, the data scientist there. And he wrote this very interesting thing. He said, the power of a full, full stack data science generalist is not something that you can go and replicate or turn into an assembly line. And he has in his blog post this really, really interesting line. He said, the goal of data science is not to execute. Right? So that's your takeaway from AnacondaCon for all your budget holders and stakeholders. The goal of data science is not to execute. Just give us money and we're going to do stuff. Right? Um, now, actually, he goes further and he explains himself. He says, the goal of data science is to develop and to learn new business capabilities. And when you are going to such uncharted waters, when you are trying to discover unknown unknowns, you can't really put an operational pipeline in place for that. There's a lot of learning that you have to do. Um, and there's inherent uncertainty in that. And he says, when you try to make, when you try to basically dissect this thing too early into little stages, then you actually remove the opportunity for learning. You remove the agility from the process. And, and you narrow that context. That, that third point in his list here is actually really, really important, right? Uh, data science is so, it, it sits at the intersection of so many different concerns. Uh, integrating all that context is actually where the value comes from. So a big motivation for my talk today is to broaden the conversation around what data science is and isn't and how to think about it in the context of uh, enterprise data analytics. So uh, I just want to recap something I've been saying for a long time now, that the essence of data science is about a data-driven, agile development of statistical models, right? I think that's, that's really at the heart of it. That's what we're really trying to do when we engage in data science. Um, and, that, uh, and that practice really has an empiricism sort of strewn, out, strewn throughout it. So whether you're looking at the source data, whether you're doing some you know, initial bit of like uh, modeling, whatever you might be doing, you're applying this empiricism. You're always going to be asking, why do I believe this to be true? Um, and that really, for me, makes it a science. I really see it as being very, very similar to um, the, the physical sciences, which is where my educational background is. Um, and if you look at the different steps, okay, if you look at what a data science workflow looks like, not in the complicated Gardner style, but in a very uh, stylized way, these different steps of what a data scientist's workflow is, these steps are themselves, they look fairly benign. They look like things that you may have already tools for, or even entire groups to do. So we have data wrangling tools, we have data exploration tools, right? We have, well, maybe we don't have feature engineering tools or you know, model development we might do in SAS, SPSS. But each of these things, when you break it apart, each of these things are disciplines or, or practice areas that we might have some knowledge about. So if we, if we look at it this way, and we look at this workflow, we can ask, why is it so hard to operationalize this workflow? Why does Eric Olson say you can't operate data science, that this is all the data science is? And, and this is where the category error is, because it's exactly like science. If you look at science, science is also a workflow. In the physical sciences, anyone who's been through middle school can tell you, we observe things, we come up with hypotheses, we make predictions, we do experiments, and then we refine and iterate. Right? But I don't think anyone would say just because we have a workflow for science that we can just turn the crank and get Einstein out of it. Right? That's no, no one says we can operate that pipeline and boom, we have like Einstein as a service, right? EAS, none of that. So, um, because the, in, this, in this thing, there's actually a couple of little, little steps that are really critical. Number one, where do the hypotheses come from? 
right? A lot of people here in this room have scientific backgrounds, and you know, right, that uh, Newton has this quote that no great discovery was ever made without a bold guess. Well, bold guesses, they come from intuition, the spark of insight. And also, um, when it comes to designing experiments, right, the actual creation of an experiment is a non-trivial thing. Designing a great experiment and designing a total waste of money experiment, that's an art. So, the scientists themselves actually know this, and, and one of my favorite comics from my days as a scientist, so this one from Sid Harris, you know, sometimes a miracle occurs. You don't explain how you kind of came up with this intuition, but you did, and now you're in a much better area of exploration. So there's always a human in the loop, whether you're doing data science or whether you're doing science, this infinite realm of possibilities and possible uh, explanations somehow get reduced to a more finite subset that is much more fruitful to explore. So in this way, I would say that the code and the tools and the things that we use to do data science is very similar to the way that math is used by science, right? You can't do science without math. Science is a thing that you do with math. But no one would say that science is just a whole bunch of math applied auto in an automated fashion, right? And so in this way, data science as well. You cannot just say, well, the data scientists are punching a bunch of code into an editor. If we had an automated way to create this code, we would be done, and we would not need to pay these data scientists their incredible salaries. But um, you know, there's actually value they add to the process. I would say that to all of you, and I think it's true. Um, but, uh, but actually, I think uh, in a deeper way, this, the, the, re the relationship between data science and science is much deeper. It is a mode of inquiry. It's not just a process, a, a, a discipline we, we practice and kind of rinse and repeat. It's actually a mode of inquiry, and it's a mode of inquiry into business models. So this is, this is why people like Eric and others, other data scientists that, that I, I read and follow, um, they, they all express sentiments very similar to this. Right? Data science is a mode of inquiry. And so um, you know, to make this more concrete, if you think about data itself, right, to take this kind of philosophical stuff and reduce something very, very practical. You think about everyone's got data, but where does your data actually come from? Where does data actually come from? It's not actually objective, right? That CSV file, that Excel file, it doesn't just materialize. Something produced that data, okay? And so the thing that produced the data, the thing that did the measuring, that device, that software stack, that whatever, the service you bought it from, that data came from something. And every single sensor in the world has an implicit set of models built into it, into this very design. And this is the whole point of it. Standard business analytics, standard BI, standard kinds of analysis that businesses are used to operationalizing, they are about counting measurements, reading off measurements and counting them. Data science is that mode of inquiry that lets you build better rulers, better measurement instruments. And to give you a very concrete example, this is a close-up of this is a close-up of a CCD chip, right? So you think about a camera or a video sensor, that's, we would typically call that raw input. But even that raw input has a set of models built into it. Almost all of the CCD sensors that you guys interface with, all the camera sensors that you interface with, they're actually monochromatic. So they only see in black and white, but there is a tiny grid of RGGB uh, color filters laid on top of it so that it can see in color. So at every level, every point of measurement, every way that we gather data, there are models built into it. And a good data scientist, someone who is actually practicing the art of, of data science, they are able to think deeply and ask questions about where are these different assumptions getting baked into my model? And they go all the way down to the sensor. So data science is not merely about the tools. Um, if you just look at the tools, if you just look at tooling and who's using what tools and what are they putting into the tools and what are they clicking on, you can partition people, you can build processes, but that's, that you're going to miss what's actually going on, right? The, the data, you know, a good data scientist, I think, can do a lot of work just in Excel. Now, they're not going to be happy only staying in Excel, but I would, I would argue that a good data scientist can absolutely do a lot of work in Excel because the, the algorithms, the math is well known. So, again, Instead of thinking about data science as um, this, this really arcane thing that, that you know, it's, it's a process that we're trying to, to turn into an assembly line, think about it as a mode of inquiry. Think about it as a kind of literacy, right? And some of the tools that we use are going to give us that, they're going to afford that literacy better than others. Excel, not so much. Things like Python, much better. Um, but that's what it's really about. And, and then kind of as, a, as an extension of that concept, real data scientists, by engaging in this mode of inquiry in their businesses, they are inevitably going to be 
force multipliers, and they're also going to be agents for organizational change. Because they're going to start asking questions, they're going to start questioning assumptions, they're going to start really thinking about how the business operates. Um, I see some nodding heads. I mean, this is, this is very, very important, right? Because this is the kind of, what I would say is counter-messaging to Gardner. My little cute rotation matrix is just me being snarky, but this is really the messaging, is that data science is not this thing that you put on an island in ivory tower. Data science is a way of going about and building new kinds of business understanding. So uh, another more accessible metaphor is if you think about yourself, you find yourself in a dark cave, and this is, you know, people talk about insight, and they want tools for insight, right? In the business analytics space, we've seen this a lot. If you're in a dark cave, you would think, well, gosh, it would be handy to have a flashlight, right? And so, yes, in a, in a small cave, you have a flashlight, very handy. And you point that flashlight somewhere, and you might find yourself some insight, okay? But if you find yourself in the mines of Moria, a flashlight's not going to help you. In fact, an entire hobbit army filled, all equipped with flashlights are not going to help you. What you really need is you need a wizard, right? You need someone who basically is operating at a different level. Um, and the reason is not only are they operating at a different level with, you know, light shining in all directions, but when they do find something, they can do something about it, right? Your hobbits can say, well, there's a Balrog here and an orc there, but I don't know, you know. Um, so this is, the, this is the thing, is that you're actually... It's about equipping people with a new kind of skill set. It's about getting people to operate in a different kind of mode. Data science is a mode of inquiry. And so while we're speaking of wizards and, and, and things like that, so this takes me to my next topic, which is about people. Right? Data science really is about the people. It's about how do we equip people to do better work. And um, to go back to Gardner, one of the things they cautioned, one of the things they, they sort of dinged us for is that Anaconda um, does offer people a Python programming environment, and that is a kind of a jungle of different libraries and tools and imports. Uh, citizen data scientists will find themselves in unchartered territory within Anaconda's environment. And, um, and, and I think that there's a really fun exchange that happened on Twitter uh, just a few weeks back that illustrate the danger with this kind of thinking, that, oh, gosh, the programming stuff, the imports, there's so many of them. How, you know, how do you spell import? That's a lot of work. Um, so here is, here's what happened on Twitter that was just amazing to watch. So this guy, this is, well, this dates it. It was uh, March 15th. So Beto O'Rourke here in Texas, he announced his candidacy for president. And um, this gentleman did a Google, you know, search analytics um, uh, a Google Trends search, and he, he basically compared Beto to Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, and others. And he said, look, Beto's announcement didn't even, didn't even register. Everyone's still searching for all these other candidates. It's a, it's a no-op. And then Nate Silver comes out and basically just pones him and says, look, you're not using Google search correctly. You're not using Google search analytics correctly. Um, Google actually does all the hard work on the back end to aggregate search terms into topics because people will misspell politicians' names. People sometimes spell O'Rourke with or without an apostrophe. So Google does all the hard work and the text processing to give you a topic search, and you should be using Google topic search. And if you do that, then you see that Beto O'Rourke completely dominated all of the other Democratic uh, contenders. This is a very, very simple thing. If you guys think about the push for simplified data science tools, simplified business analytics tools, it doesn't get simpler than literally typing Beto into a search box. It doesn't get simpler than that. And even in that, it is so simple to screw it up if you don't understand what's actually going on behind it. That's a really, this is a really important thing because like this is kind of cute to laugh at because it's so obviously bad. But, I mean, you can actually see in the tweet here the, the screenshot under, uh, with Nate Silvers, it says, United States Senator, United, United States Senator, former Vice President, right? Over here, it, search, it says search term, search term, search term, search term. So any of you who've done any kind of Google Trends Analytics, you know what's going on here. This is using Google's AI, this is not, right? And so what's interesting here is if this gentleman was actually working for one of the campaigns, right? Imagine if this was the way that he was doing data science or doing data analytics for the campaign. He is engaging in analytical malpractice. Right? The biggest threat to his, to his um, candidate just appeared, and he thought it was a no-op. So it's not about simplified tooling. It's actually about the mindset and the capability of the people. Right? Feynman has this amazing quote. He says, the first thing you must make sure of is that you're not fooling yourself, and you're the easiest person to fool. Data science, again, that empiricism, it's a mode of inquiry. It's an empiricism. It's a rationalism. It is really about not just pulling some random insight, not just some hobbit shining a flashlight and saying, oh, look, an orc. It's about seeing all of it and saying, what am I not seeing? So if we actually, so we get dinged on offering programmatic interfaces, on trying to insist that people should learn Python, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
And uh, what if we made things that were you know, easier, more point and clicky? Well, it still it would lead to this kind of thing, but at scale. And we don't want to do that. So I would encourage you, next time you're kind of engaged in this kind of discussion, to think about the difference between languages and tools. There is a fluency. There is an expressivity in language. Language is a human instinct. Tools, tools are what we have in our garage. Right? Think about how many tools you have in your garage versus how many languages you might speak. Completely different things. And this brings, up to the, brings us to the topic, of course, of citizen data science, which Scott talked about in his opening keynote. Um, and I've got some ideas around this term. It's actually interesting, because if you find people talking about citizen data science, it's always people talking about citizen data science. Very few people show up, like I go to a lot of trade shows, no one comes up to me and says, hi, I'm a citizen data scientist, right? <laughs> it's always someone talking about other people, like, oh, I've got some citizen data scientists, and dot, 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 right? So, if you actually try to pin people down on it, the thing is, I actually reject the concept because open data science is very democratized. And, and I'll kind of go into some more detail on that. But because it's literacy and not a role, everyone can be literate. It, you don't need to distinguish between the literate and the illiterate in your business, right? If you really try to pin people down on it, it's basically just this idea that I have a group of people who I don't think can ever learn to code. I just see them, they have trouble clicking on things, right? That is, it's a very pejorative assessment, and maybe if you have people who can't learn Python, you know, it's a very easy thing to learn. Um, maybe you need to reassess, right? And that's performance review time probably coming up soon. So, um, actually, here's the thing. My eight-year-old can learn Python, right? Does that make him a citizen data scientist? I don't know. Um, and actually, it's not just him. This is a room full of people here, here in Austin. There's a, there's a program called Hello World. They teach... Uh, elementary and middle school kids how to write Python for everything from doing web apps to games to self-driving cars. So there's, you know, middle school, middle school girl who came up to me who was doing this uh, auto auto self-driving car thing. She was writing some TensorFlow stuff. She's 12. She's not getting paid six figures to go be a data analyst somewhere or to be a citizen data scientist. She's learning Python, right? And it's not just her. This is a room full of students at Berkeley taking their intro data science course, which is taught in Python using notebooks. This is a room full of over a thousand students who are they're not computer programmers, right? They do not aspire to be computer programmers. They are everyone from you know, geneticists and astrophysicists. There's lawyers there who want to do e-discovery with natural uh, language processing. There's uh, social scientists, climatologists, everybody in that room. Those are citizens. And also, a lot of them are scientists, and they're going to go and get PhDs and then get very disappointed with their salaries and then go become data scientists in industry <laughs> that take your, then that's your next generation of citizen data scientists, right? Um, and, um, and actually, there's also an implicit thing about this, this assumption around citizen data science, which is it's too hard. Programming is a very esoteric activity. People can't figure out how to do it. Point and click tools are much more accessible. So let's look at this, right? Some of the leading tools in Gardner's own magic quadrant for BI, you know, business intelligence and, and, and uh, data science tools like RapidMiner, Tableau. Tableau uh, publishes their stats. They have something like half a million users. Uh, RapidMiner has about 400,000. So we'll put them on a chart since they're both visual tools and I'm a visualization guy. This is Anaconda's weekly uniques. On the left is the total size of their co user cohort. This is our weekly uniques. So you tell me which one is more democratized, which one is more accessible. And we recently just came out with our data science survey. Hopefully many of you answered. Uh, if not, there's still a little bit of time, but uh, we'll be coming out with a blog post summarizing our findings. But one of the things that we found was that when one of the questions we put in there, when we were about 3,000 respondents, we did this analysis, and we asked people, is Python or R your first programming language? And out of you know, 3,000 respondents, you can look across, across the industry, or, 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 um, or sorry, this is their job, their role, across roles, 50% of people were using Anaconda, and they're using Python and R for the first time. That was their first language. Uh, for some reason, systems, network engineers, it's like 90% of them. They're learning, you know, Python or R is their first language. Um, when we go and we ask people, what is your job function, right? Many people who take the Anaconda data science survey are data scientists, but many of them are business analysts. Many of them are software developers. And so when we just drill down to those categories, you look at why are you learning data science? A lot of them are not learning data science to become data scientists. They're learning data science to do their job. You can't read this text. But this says, I'm interested in applying data science to my current role. And that's the leading answer for both of those categories. So it is a literacy. It is a skill. It's a mode of, it's a, it's a, it's a mode of thought that you can apply no matter what your job title is. Now, a lot of them are also interested in becoming data scientists, I think, because the salaries of data scientists are better. But, um, uh, but you know, 
it's, it's a real thing. It's a real thing. And lastly, we see across different industries as well. Um, like, oh, sorry, this is still kind of across job function, but if we ask people, are you learning basic Python or R or advanced Python or R, you can sort of see the maturity, overall maturity of the cohorts. Accounting and finance, right? A lot of those people are learning Python for the first time. And they're really getting into it. They're trying to skill up from Excel and, and Tableau and things like that. But as you just go down here, you can see sort of the maturity go over to the right. Um, but across the board here, you know, it's a pretty good balance of people first coming, just, just new to the ecosystem, just learning. It, this is the picture. This is a picture of a revolution that's happening, that's currently happening. Because if it was just one job function upgrading, if it was just one particular cohort, if it was data science is just the next BI or data mining or something like that, you would not see this kind of pattern. You would see one category of role really going hard into it, and the other's like, whatever, what is this thing, right? So this is a broad-based revolution that's happening right now um, in, in business. Uh, I, I think probably people in the room, I'm preaching to the choir, you're here because you believe that. But, uh, but really across the board, numerical quantitative computing, numerical simulation, these for a long time have been relegated to a niche of, of computing. And that's no longer the case. Um, they are contributing to a major transformation of IT. So you hear people sometimes talking about data is the new oil, or AI is the new electricity. And the thing is, oil, electricity, those things, are they power machines. They leverage human muscle, right? They make us more powerful because our muscles are weak. But data and compute, they leverage and they, they enhance our intellectual capabilities. And that's actually incredibly powerful. It's a completely different kind of power. Um, so, this transformation of enterprise IT that's happening, though, it's, um, it's not the only one, right? It's not the only one. Um, and I'll talk about that later. But to, to sum up this, this section, I really want to drive home the point that data science is literacy. And it should be thought of as a literacy. It's not a coding skill. It's not just, um, oh, it's a set of tools I need to learn. It is a kind of literacy. And that means everyone can be literate. Everyone can learn it. And furthermore, in the business, there will be a clear distinction between people who are literate and people who are not. And that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a VP of something, a CXO of something. You're going to need to understand how to actually think statistically and quantitatively about your business. Now, of course, I say all that, but data science, as I would put it, is clearly done with open source tools, right? And so let's think about open source. Let's talk about open source. There's definitely been a lot of news about open source. If you guys have, have uh, been paying attention for the last, in the last year, there's been a lot of news about it. And I think it's time for us to rethink and reconsider what it really means to do open source in this era of cloud and, and big cloud vendors. So I said earlier that data science is part of this, it's the leading edge of this quantitative revolution in business. Um, but it's not the only revolution, it's not the only transformation that's happening, right? One of the things that's kind of confounding for us is that there are three concurrent transformations happening. Data science uh, being one of them. That's the one on the left. Um, there's an open source transformation that's happening around software development for business. And that's the middle, the OSI logo. And then the right is, of course, a cloud. Right? There's a cloud transformation of IT. And these three things are all happening all at once. And they intertwine and intersect in different ways. That would be quite confounding. So these last two have been the, the intersection of open source and cloud have really been at the heart of several interesting incidents over the last six months. So if you guys have seen, um, many large, well-known, well-established pieces of open source software have been changing their license uh, structures. So Redis, uh, the Redis Labs, they changed the licensing structure. Uh, MongoDB changed the licensing structure. Uh, Elastic has had to do so. Timescale DB, several others are, are doing this kind of thing. And this has led to, let's say, a tremendous amount of gnashing of teeth in the open source community. Um, and Red Monk, for instance, uh, they write about this as the, the cloud and the open source powder keg. Like, they, they, they basically, they, they think that this was bound to happen. They were calling this thing about six years ago, they, they called it. And so, um, here in their blog post, right, they, they point out, for instance, this conflict between Amazon and Elastic. Um, you know, the permissive license, the permissive license around Elastic is what allowed to get so much adoption so quickly. But at the same time, it also lets Amazon eat their lunch. And so um, what their point was, and they've been making this point for about seven years now, gosh, eight years, um, the Redmond guys have said, look, cloud fundamentally is about destroying the enterprise procurement cycle. That's all it is. That's what it's about. 
And so now the conversations are on utilization, sizing, compute, and storage, things like that. Um, and in this kind of new procurement model, you can use open source as a great way for people to self-POC. It's, it's an accelerant, right? And if you do that, those open source pieces of software become APIs, they become standards. And so that kind of, that kind of open source API can become a kind of a business moat. And, um, you know, this is a double-edged sword because if you are a business who is not a cloud vendor, if you're one of the businesses who makes this open source software, um, and you start wanting to monetize that moat, it puts you in direct conflict, really, with your users. And this is why these other open source companies uh, have run into a bit of trouble. Um, and the, uh, you, know, you have blog posts like this that are asking, well, th this is actually a really, really well written uh, a blog at Motherboard. If you guys have not read it, I would encourage you to read it. It's very nice. But it really asks, you know, is this sustainable? Because we have all these open source projects people built for free, and then these big cloud vendors are taking this free labor and exploiting it. Is this sustainable? And, um, and, and I look at that and I sort of have to ask myself, well, if you're going to talk about the sustainability crisis in open source, what sustainability crisis? Sa sustainability of what? Because the sustainability of the maintenance cost of a piece of software is different than sustaining innovation in a particular technical area. And, um, and you know, over the last 30 years, there's just been this evolution of open source. We moved from this like Libre software, GNU, counterculture, counter movement to being a, essentially a platform hegemony around Linux to now it's the most rapidly innovating model for development. As Scott said, it's, it's where all of this innovation is happening. It's all happening in the open source space. That evolution is clear and it's happening, but if all that innovation is just basically um, exploiting free labor to give a bit of value to a few, a few cloud vendors, maybe that's not really the best model for the world. And I think that in order to actually understand this, especially in the context of Anaconda, in the context of the PyDB ecosystem, there's another confounding factor we have to understand, which is that there's actually, I would say, two kinds of open source that we're looking at. And the classical open source, which uh, you guys might recognize the various logos here, I call them classical open source because they're generally built by devs for devs. Devs write them to solve problems, which they have. They scratch an itch. Turns out it's the same itch as a lot of other devs. People get together, party on the code, and now you got a project, right? And that's kind of cool. But the open source software that came out in the SciPy community and in the PyData community, it's also to scratch an itch. But it's because no, no programmer knows how to write that stuff except the nerds who you know, are over there in the numerical computing land, right? If you look, if you've ever, if you've ever gone to a SciPy or PyData conference and you look at the kind of educational backgrounds of the people who created these projects, they all are scientists. They're all people working in some kind of high-end analytical space. They're not computer programmers by training. They had to program in order to get their work done. And so there's sort of um, programming and open source is a means to an end aspect to the PyData and the SciPy communities. And, and I bring this up, this is actually a really important thing because in the, there's a, there's a wonderful, wonderful um, book by Clay Shirky called Here Comes Everybody. It's about crowdsourcing and the power of harnessing uh, crowd um, innovation and, and kind of network intelligence. And something I've observed over the last uh, decade is that open source projects absolutely have a maturity cycle. They start with being one person, well, Clay, Clay calls it me first collaboration. I'm collaborating with myself. One person scratching their own itch to then that person having a place, usually a mailing list on Usenet or something like that, and they start finding other people who have similar things and they collaborate. And this is essentially the cycle that's gone on in so many of the projects that are fundamental to our ecosystem. And we go from lone programmer to industry standard. And, um, and so maybe you've not really thought about it this way, but a a really broadly adopted piece of software is that. It's an industry standard. Um, and it really, for me, represents the culmination of step three, the, the culmination of collaboration. Where we haven't gotten to in a lot of the open source ecosystem is going to step four around collective action, right? Because everyone wants to have the right to fork. Everyone wants to have the right to sort of diverge in the governance. All the governance schemes we talk about are very open to this kind of thing. And so, um, you know, step three here, when it talks about fixing a market failure, it's a very interesting terminology because that market failure is everything from people, you know, existing vendors, big vendors like SAS and MATLAB failing to serve the needs of, you know, double E professors. Um, 
that market failure can be people, large, large vendors of enterprise IT, failing to meet the needs of containerization and things like that. There's a lot of different ways that open source folks get to that point of collaboration, building things that become APIs and industry standards, but then everyone sort of gets stuck there. And so the Pi data and the SciPy community, though, the way I think it's different than the, um, than the classical open source and the infrastructure open source stuff, it's really been pursuing the art of the possible. It's not just about solving kind of well-known problems. It's been pursuing the art of the possible for 20 years. And there is a really interesting ethos that has evolved in that community. For whatever reasons, the projects that we see become successful, they have limited scope. Right? They don't initially launch with a team that came out of like LinkedIn or something to go and build some Apache project to go and raise a bunch of VC money and then get acquired by somebody and have a big exit. That's not why people in the Python space do open source. They do it to push the art of the possible. And they limit their scope, they deliver concrete utility, but concrete utility meeting innovation. And they generally have this ethos of needing to play well with others. So it's sort of like a, a self-stabilizing um, self set of Legos. And um, they also have to have reasonable leadership. People cannot be just total jerks, right? Because it is still a collaboration of people. And this is an amazing thing. This kind of swarm network decentralized intelligence has out-innovated, has out-innovated faster than any other organizing principle I've ever seen. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes when we bemoan the sustainability problem in open source, we say, oh gosh, you know, I can fit all the maintainers of SciPy and NumPy in my minivan. And that's that's like, why, can't, why are they starving? Why can't we pay them? And on the one hand, that's true. That is sad. But on the other hand, think about what an amazing intellectual leverage that is, that a minivan full of people can produce billions and billions of dollars of value to the entire world. Right? That's actually an incredible thing, that we can actually have a way of organizing, a way of crowdsourcing, a way of collaborating that creates that much leverage out of just a few brains. It's actually something, while we're bemoaning the sustainability problem, at the same time, we should celebrate how this collaboration has yielded such incredible innovation. And so the, the difference, again, to reiterate, between the classical open source, um, infrastructure open source, uh, you know, sort of Unix neckbeards writing the next best orchestration tool versus uh, science neckbeards? Uh, you know, I guess, yeah, and not everyone has a neckbeard, but um, the point is that between the sci-fi community and the kind of the, 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 the old school Unix Libre software community, there's absolutely very, very different, uh, I think, kind of a different set of things that are happening. And on the one hand, it's a lot of it is commoditization. Something that Scott has said to me is, you know, we used to sort of talk about open source solving well-known problems. And it's like, yeah. You know, this problem has gotten to a point where a single person in a garage coding or in a basement coding for a few weekends can actually put something together that's reasonable. That's commoditization. But over in the scientific world, in the PyData world, um, people like Travis slaving away for years to build something that's pursuing the art of the possible, right? Building something very new and interesting. And so that solving advanced problems, they appear to be niche. And now, of course, we see that all these advanced problems they were solving were not so niche after all, right? They're at the very heart of what businesses want to do. So in both cases, I would say open source does address or it facilitates the creation of an open marketplace and a marketplace of innovation. Um, but, but I think it's really, really important while we think about open source sustainability, when we talk about these kinds of problems, that we're understanding all the different dynamics, right? There's multiple things that are happening in terms of commoditization. And then the Python community has been really great open source. And that open source has been delivering a lot of innovation. And these are two different reasons to do open source. And it leads to a very interesting set of questions, which I don't necessarily say I have answers for. But in this coming age of machine learning, when it's not just about code anymore, it's about code and data and access to a lot of compute infrastructure, you know, I asked this very interesting question of like, why did TensorFlow not come out of the SciPy community? We had a lot of the pieces there. We produced the Anno after all. But TensorFlow did not come out of SciPy. TensorFlow is a single vendor open source project out of Google. Now, they want to have a large community. They solicit contributor, con contributions from everyone. But it is a single vendor, cloud vendor piece of open source software. And you know, in this day and age, with so many large, well-capitalized vendors coming into the open source ecosystem, are things like Jupyter, Pandas, are these the last great hits of community source swarm, you know, decentralized parallel innovation? And, um, and again, you know, this is not a question I have a particularly good answer for, but it's something I think a lot about here at Anaconda. Um, we obviously are 
uh, we, we are a deeply, we care deeply about the community, we care deeply about innovation, and for me, uh, when I see the kinds of things that are happening with some of the other open source vendors and open source libraries, uh, as, as cloud vendors sort of uh, take a lot of what they're doing, I recognize that we have something very different and special in the Python ecosystem. And I encourage all of you as well to have clear thinking about this, that these are different kinds of open source. There's different reasons why companies build and sustain and support open source. For us at Anaconda, I think at this point in time, it's clear to me that our role is to be a good steward of an open ecosystem, right? As the open source ecosystem evolves, we want to be stewards of this innovation commons. It's a commons for people to bring ideas, for people who are big companies, small companies, it could be individuals, for everyone to actually come together and do parallel innovation to create new standards, things like Aero, there's a lot of new things coming, model, de you know, declarative model interfaces, things like Onyx. As we evolve, as, as machine learning evolves, as AI evolves, there's going to absolutely be a need for us to have open standards around that. And unfortunately, a lot of the cloud vendors are learning that they can create open source software to get a lot of developer mind share and, and essentially establish walled gardens around certain APIs. We absolutely see ourselves as a counterpoint to that. We want to maintain um, open standards. We want to prevent monoculture. And we really want to continue to invest in and foster community-oriented innovation. So that's what you can expect to get here at Anaconda. When you come here to Anaconda Con, that's the sort of people you're going to meet. You're going to meet a lot of people who work on these kinds of tools and projects. Um, that's really what we're all about in this, in this open source world. It's not just about is it open source, is it a license. It's really about is it open innovation, right? Is it community innovation? So thank you very much. I hope you had a great time here at AnacondaCon. And uh, come back next year. <laughs>